Thank you, Sadhanandi. Uh, yeah, very, very good to be here with you. Well, I'm here in the London Buddhist Centre in our basement shrine, shrine room. And really lovely to be joined by people from all over the world, from all of you all over the world. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking for a little bit this evening about um, the work of Ian Medilchrist, particularly the work um, as written up in, in, in this book. I don't know if you can see this book, The Master and His Emissary. I know some of you will be familiar with this book. Um, he's also written a, another book, a, a massive epic work in two volumes that's just come out recently called The Matter, Recording in progress. The Matter with Things. Oh, I'm being recorded. Mm -hmm. um, the Matter with Things. But I am going to focus on just um, little themes. Well, I say little themes, they're big themes, but a few themes from the master and his emissary. And I was really privileged to interview Ian McGilchrist um, uh, last year. And um, uh, yeah, when I interviewed him, I was very, very um, uh, engaged in the interview and I completely forgot uh, anything that he had said or anything that I had said until I re-watched it recently, well, just two days ago. Um, and uh, I think it's a really um, worthwhile interview to watch. The reason I say that is not because um, uh, um, of me so much as the things he says. Well, I was trying to draw him out into themes that are relevant to the Dharma. Uh, he's given lots of interviews that you'll find on YouTube. This one feels to me particularly interesting to Dharma practitioners. Anyway, um, I'm going to try and... Um, what am I trying to do? Just recap a little bit. Uh, 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 give you a tiny taste of Ian McGilchrist's ideas. So Ian McGilchrist, he's a consultant psychiatrist. Um, he studied the brain, he's studied neuroscience, he's worked as a psychiatrist. But earlier on in his career, he was, um, he, uh, well, he first studied English at Oxford and taught English at Oxford uh, for some years before retraining in medicine. So he's one of these people who straddles the, word, the worlds of um, science and arts, literature. Uh, he is um, a polymath, a phenomenal intellect, and is incredibly well read. And his thesis is um, um, that, that there are two sort of primary modes of attention that human beings can have, and um, that these are um, specialised in, in the two hemispheres of the brain. Uh, the two hemispheres of the brain, it's long been sort of known that actually both hemispheres participate in most activities uh, that we're engaged in. But Ian McGilchrist is saying the way they view the world, that the mode of attention that both hemispheres sort of place or play in the world is very different, is complementary, that we need both, but that the... Um, the mode that is particularly dominant at the moment in contemporary Western culture is the mode that actually should be uh, subservient. That's the left hemisphere's mode of attention. Uh, I'm going to come on later on to say a little bit more about those two modes of attention. Um, but first of all, I want to just sort of address something that, well, I know I, when I read this book, first read this book, was skeptical about, and I know others have been, which is how can a neuroscientist, a psychiatrist, uh, teach us something about the Dharma when um, science, and particularly neuroscience, we might associate as um, very, very materialist, rooted in uh, a materialist perspective of the world, which says that we are just matter, we are just our bodies, uh, that consciousness is just a phenomenon that arises in the brain, that the brain is like this supercomputer that directs the body, controls the body, and that, um, yeah, we're biological machines, that there's nothing, once the body dies, there's no more uh, of us left. That's a mater scientific materialist worldview. So often, um, uh, biologists, medics will espouse uh, 
the body is a machine and we is nothing but the body and the brain is the sort of controller of all of that. Well, Ian McGilchrist is not espousing that view. So that's why I find him so interesting. He's not, definitely not a materialist. He's, um, he, he, he's very, very clear that, um, well, he thinks that consciousness is probably primary. You can't sort of prove that, he can't prove that, but he thinks that matter probably arises out of consciousness rather than the other way around. So that's just fantastic. That's just so dharmic. I mean, it's incredible to have a scientist, a psychiatrist, a neuroscientist, uh, rigorously uh, uh, schooled in science and arguing his case from science, uh, be a non-materialist. Um, in the book, in, 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 in The Master of His Emissary, he's a little bit more equivocal. Let me just read you something he says. Uh, about consciousness. Is consciousness a product of the brain? The only certainty here is that anyone who thinks they can answer this question with certainty has to be wrong. We have only our conceptions of consciousness and of the brain to go on. And the one thing we do know for certain is that everything we know of the brain is a product of consciousness. Everything that we know of the brain is a product of consciousness. That is, scientifically speaking, far more certain than that consciousness itself is a product of the brain. So that, for me, feels um, much more in line with the Dharma. When I interviewed him, I asked him whether he could be a little less equivocal. What was his personal view about consciousness uh, uh, versus, as it were, matter. And I'm going to ask uh, Nick, who's the tech host here, to play just a little clip from the interview uh, where Ian talks about that. So Nick, if he's able to, will uh, magically zoom us into this clip. Hopefully you can now see on your screen uh, the video, and he's going to press play. Uh, I, I wonder if you could say more about consciousness. And um, I know that uh, in the book, you 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 say that well, we we don't know whether consciousness is an emergent phenomenon of the brain, or whether the brain is is mediating consciousness. And um, and of course, how can one be sure? Uh, but I wondered whether you, you, as, as you know, uh, as it were, off the record, have an opinion. Do you, uh, you know, do you have a personal view as to which is more likely? I certainly do. It is pretty much incoherent to imagine that consciousness somehow emanates out of matter. Uh, in fact, I adopt the view that matter is a phenomenon in consciousness that the cosmos is conscious mm -hmm. and that matter is a, if you like, a phase of consciousness. I'm using the term in the scientific sense that, you know, water has phases. In mm -hmm. one, it's hard and solid and immobile and can break your head. Uh, mm -hmm. In another, it's flowing and transparent. In another, it is invisible. So uh, in, in this sense, I think that matter is a, an element of resistance in consciousness. And that takes me to another point, that one of the themes of the book is that resistance is very important for the coming about of anything at all. Uh, right. That it is in itself creative, that, that in a way, creation needs an element of resistance. And matter is a way of solidifying and slowing down the movement of spirit and energy and giving it form for a while. So I see it as, I mean, after all, in a very literal way, um, I, I know that I, I only know matter because of my consciousness. There's no question about that. But we don't know that I only know consciousness because of matter. I mean, that, that is 
that may be the case or it may not. We, we don't know, but I have a very strong hunch that uh, it can't possibly just be emanating. By the way, um, people like to talk about uh, interconnections as being the point, that somehow when you reach a certain number of interconnections, uh, billions of these, then you start to get consciousness. Um, it may interest listeners to know that the cerebellum, which is the ancient part of the brain at the base of the brain and posterior in the skull, has four times as many neurons as the cerebrum on which consciousness depends. And it has an exponentially larger number of connections, but it cannot support consciousness. Mm. Uh, and, and it's also become obvious that uh, creatures that don't have neurons have awareness, uh, plants, for example. Hmm. Yeah, thank you, Nick. So there you see it quite, quite um, uh, very measured and cogently kind of uh, argued, which I think is um, uh, really necessary and remarkable because our culture in the modern West, in contemporary West, is so much um, based in, rooted in this scientific materialist perspective. And that scientific materialist perspective is um, an obstacle to practicing the Dharma. Bhante um, Sangharachita, the founder of Sri Ratna, has, um, I think he said that in a way it, it would be better to see the universe as alive, as everything, as conscious. Uh, uh, um, he says somewhere in a seminar that he tries to see everything as somehow having some degree of awareness. That's easier when you are in the natural world. Perhaps it's harder to see concrete as uh, aware, as conscious. Uh, Sangrachita says that he finds it difficult to see plastic as <laughs> conscious. But then he says that that's, he thinks that's a limitation for him, not a limitation on plastic. Dharmic perspective, a Buddhist perspective, it would be better to see everything as of the nature of mind. And uh, Sangharachita has even said that if we are unable to see the universe as somehow alive, if all that we can see is a dead universe, such a universe is one in which enlightenment won't be possible. So it's, it's, it's pretty important to challenge uh, scientific materialism, perhaps uh, um, in our teaching, but also because we live in this contemporary Western society. And uh, I know that I, for one, can be infected by views that are current, particularly scientific views that seem so... Um, um, to have such sort of weight to them. So I'm going to talk for uh, another 10, 15 minutes. I want to draw out uh, a few more themes. And then I'm going to, um, uh, we're going to have breakout groups. So we're going to have small groups where I'm going to ask you to discuss, do you, what do you think? Do you think I'm talking nonsense that Ian Medilchrist is wrong when he says consciousness is primary? Because after all, you can't prove this. Uh, or, you know, do you, do, would you argue for more of a materialist uh, perspective? That's one thing that you might want to talk about. And then, then we're going to have some questions. So do come prepared to ask questions and I'll do my best to, to answer them. But before we do that, I wanted to touch on the two hemispheres of the brain that Ian McGilchrist talks about and they're different modes of attention. They're different sort of functions uh, in, 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 um, in, in life. So what he says is that the left hemisphere of the brain is particularly, um, as it were, specialized in giving very focused, detailed attention to particulars. It, it's that sort of um, attention that um, uh, analyzes things into parts and then looks at the parts in detail. Um, when I say looks at the parts in detail, actually what he says is what, what the left hemisphere's mode of attention does is it um, categorizes what it sees 
into general categories um, like uh, friend or foe or table or tree or, or, or food or danger. It sort of categorizes things into uh, uh, generalities. Um, it's efficient at processing uh, data in a sort of rational, linear, rule-based way. In that sense, its, its view of the world is mechanistic and mechanical. It's a reductive view. In one sense, Ian McGilchrist says, it's like a, um, it's a good computer, it's like a computer, good at procedure and good at sort of repetitive procedure. At least this is how I understand what Ian McGilchrist is saying. If he were here, he might correct me or at least refine uh, what I've just said. The right hemisphere, by contrast, understands the world in terms of context and in terms of holes. It understands interconnections between parts. Uh, it, um, it makes sense of uh, its, its um, perceptions. It gives meaning to uh, its perceptions. It understands, for example, metaphor and ambiguity and uh, relationship. Uh, it looks at the world in an embodied way, not just in an abstracted way that the left hemisphere tends to do, you know, not just in categories, abstract categories, but actual particulars, actual embodied experience. It's also um, aware that it doesn't have the whole picture. It tries to understand the world, but it's aware of its own limitations. Whereas the left hemisphere tends to uh, be certain that it knows everything, even when it doesn't. <clears throat> so now Ian McGilchrist's um, thesis is that we need both. We need a cooperation between these two modes of attention. What he says is that um, in animals, there's also this bifurcation. Uh, um, like in a bird, you've got this sort of bifurcation. On the one hand, a bird needs to be looking for food, for seeds and uh, uh, insects, and have a very detailed, focused attention. On the other hand, the right hemisphere in the bird, um, at least I think it's that way around in birds too, um, is, um, has to have a broad awareness of its environment in case there's predators around. So he thinks that evolution has given us this specialization of two modes of attention that are sort of contradictory and competitive. They're competing with each other. What he thinks in McGilchrist's argument is that the right hemisphere should be the dominant one. By dominant, he says the master, the master who um, in a way understands the whole context, but needs a servant, an emissary to do some detailed work. And uh, so what Ian McGilchrist says is that in the, in the act of perception, when we walk into a room or a, a new environment and we're perceiving it, what happens is that the right hemisphere, as it were, has an immediate sense of the whole environment, the, the whole context. But then if you want to focus on a bowl of fruit, and in particular an orange in that bowl of fruit, it hands over to the left hemisphere who can do the detail of looking for the orange and grasping it. The left is good at grasping, it's good at utility and uh, uh, getting what it wants. But then the left hemisphere needs to hand back to the right hemisphere to put the orange in context again. It's a piece of fruit that I want to eat. That requires context again. I might go and get a plate or a knife or something. That requires context again. 
So it's right, left, right. And what Ian McGilchrist is saying is that our culture, our contemporary Western culture, has let the left one run away and think that it's in charge. And we have constantly, um, well, in the last, I don't know how many hundred years, um, been sort of um, giving over uh, dominance to this rational, materialist way of perceiving. And that that has caused all sorts of problems in our relationships with each other, with the natural world, uh, with, with ourselves even. Uh, and our notion of what it is to be human. So I'm going to play a clip, uh, or ask Nick to play a clip, where he talks a little bit about these two hemispheres, and then I want to say a few more things. The benefit of um, th those who are listening who may not have read my book, the, the idea that's encapsulated in the title is that of a, a wise spiritual master who uh, looks after a community that flourishes and grows, and he realizes that in time he can't look after everything, but he has an even more important insight, which is that he mustn't get involved with certain things if he's to maintain his all-important oversight. So he appoint, appoints his um, sort of brightest and best helper to go about on his behalf and act as a functionary, but the functionary being bright but not bright enough, believes he knows any, everything, which is always a sign of a fool. Uh, and he thinks, what does the master know? I know it all. And he adopts the cloak of the master, but not knowing what it is he doesn't know, uh, he and the master and the community fall to ruin. Now, uh, that, when I read that, and I can't remember exactly where I found it, I say I found it in Nietzsche, but when I look back, it's not really that that I found in Nietzsche. It's perhaps rather like the story of the Sorcerer's Apprentice from mm. Goethe's poem. Mm. But it, it, in The Secret of the Golden Flower, uh, there, there are texts that say exactly this, that the, what, what they call the, what I would call the left hemisphere, the analytic mind, mm. it is like a violent general who commands a fierce army from a distance, but the sword must be turned around. And what they mean by the sword must be turned around is that the intellect must understand the limits to the intellect, which it only rarely ever does. But when it does, it can then restore the master, and it actually uses the term the master and, and the, the servant, that the left hemisphere equivalent, the, the kind of noisy analytic intellect, is a very good servant, but a very poor master. Very and good. I have also found it in Rumi. I found it in um, Indian uh, texts. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's everywhere that you look in spiritual literature. There we are. Well, I think what you're arguing is a wisdom perspective. And uh, you, you beautifully lay that out in, in both scientific terms and philosophical terms. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, there, there, there is, it's an old wisdom, isn't there? That, that the intellect alone will not teach us about the most important things about being human. And yet we need it. it it's, it's so intrinsic to uh, our, our success as human beings and survival as human beings. And yet it's, it's, it has a place. So he's called it the matter with things. Uh, and... Um, yeah, well, Buddhism would say there are no things. There is only, um, I was going to say there are only processes. That comes closer to it, but it's not, it's not it. Actually, there is only one interconnected reality. Process still implies um, some things happening in time and in space. Buddhism doesn't give even primacy to time and space. There is something beyond our rational comprehension. I'm reminded of um, a book by Carlo Rivelli, who's a physicist, a contemporary physicist, uh, who has recently written a book called Reality is Not What It Seems. And he's arguing, um, it's still a theory in physics, it's not proven, he's arguing that space and time are not really fundamental um, either. Uh, that um, uh, when, you, when you look very, very finely, uh, space is a construct and time arises out of that. Uh, well, Buddhism would say something similar. Uh, Buddhism would say that time and space are actually constructs in, in um, mind. 
uh, that mind is primary. But also what Buddhism would say is mind is not a thing. So that's weird. I mean, you can just about, I can just about uh, get to the point where I can think, okay, yes, it's all happening in mind. Like you're not just, well, there you are in Melbourne and Helsinki and wherever you are, I can see sort of pixels on boxes in a screen. But actually, what I can see is happening in my awareness. And similarly, what you can see is happening in your awareness. I can understand just about that everything that we can perceive is happening in mind. But Buddhism is then saying, yeah, but mind's not a thing. It's ungraspable. Uh, it's, it's, well, it's empty. Uh, all we have is... Um, uh, well, an un ungraspable reality in which we are um, not just participants, but we're somehow um, co-creators. Maybe I'll come on to that when we, when we come on to the questions. Our role in this act of perception is not a passive one. Uh, and that's very exciting as well. Uh, it's very exciting for what it is that we're doing in this universe. So um, I'm going to suggest, though, that you break up into groups. We're just going to have 15 minutes. That's, that's not a lot, but it would be good just to, well, ask you to discuss particularly whether your view, whether you sort of either consciously or maybe even deeper down think that you are just your body and brain and that matter is all there is and that when the body dies, that's it, the lights go out. Or whether you believe in something else, in which case it'd be interesting to discuss what it is that you do think and why. Or on what are you basing a notion that there's something more than matter? What, what, what? What gives you that, um, what have you sort of, how, what evidence do you have for that? Okay, so that's one thing that perhaps you could talk about. You might have other things, particularly if you've watched the interview, there's lots in there. So we'll have about, um, I think we've got maybe about half an hour or so to do a Q&A, and then um, I'm gonna hand over back to Sardin Andy. Okay, so the first question, that we have got, as it were, a pre-prepared question is from Leah, who's in London, Leah even. So, Leah, I can't see you, but, oh yeah, there you are, wave, that's great. And unmute yourself if you can. Hey, hi, hi. Hi, great. Um, so firstly, of course, um, thank you so much for your reflections mm. and, um, you know, truly mind expanding and thought provoking. And I really can't wait for the next six months of mm. talks. Oh, that's very nice um, of you. And um, the question that I have um, is, um, what are the opportunities as well um, as the pitfalls mm. that we should be wary of um, from the meeting of neuroscience and Buddhism? Mm. Yeah, very good. So... What are the sort of opportunities and pitfalls that we should be aware of from this meeting, I guess, of neuroscience and Buddhism? Well, I think um, I'll start with the pitfall, if I may. Uh, the sort of obvious pitfall <laughs> is that because Ian McGilchrist is talking so much about brain function, it can be, if we're not paying attention, as it were, to what he's saying, it can be very easy to assume that he is saying that we are just brains, that consciousness is arising from the brain, not the other way around. He, you know, he is saying it the other way around. He's saying that, as it were, the brain is perhaps mediating consciousness, um, a bit like um, a radio would receive radio waves and then when you turn the radio on, it plays them, plays, as it were, it turns the radio waves into sound. But it's not the source of radio waves. It's the sort of receiver and translator. 
He's saying that it could be more like that, but consciousness is mediated, received, as it were, through the brain. But if we're not careful, because this sort of scientific materialist worldview is so, um, I don't know, dominant and so um, pervasive, if we're not careful, we could start just thinking he's talking in a reductionist scientific materialist perspective. That's one sort of drawback. Another drawback, and Bhante Sangharachita, my teacher, points to this drawback, is if, if we were to base our Buddhist faith, faith in Buddhism, on scientific theories, well, what happens when those scientific theories change? And what if they are superseded by another theory? Scientific theories do come and go. Uh, they tend to be superseded by better ones. Um, if we were to base our faith on the latest scientific theory, then um, it's not a great foundation. Uh, personally speaking, my, my faith, or the Buddhist word is shraddha, in the Buddha and his teachings, in, in the teaching of the potential of human enlightenment, isn't based on science, even though I studied science. Uh, it's based on my own experience of practicing uh, Buddhism and seeing that, yes, it works. I'm a long way from enlightenment, so it's not that I can say, I can uh, hand on heart say that enlightenment is something that I've experienced. Well, I've had glimpses of something along that line. I know that uh, Buddhism is transformative, not just from my own experience, but from seeing other people transform. So for me, it's not based on science. I think we've just got to be careful about that. But an advantage of opening up to scientific perspectives where they align with Buddhism, <clears throat> I think a real sort of advantage is that we can, we can start to um, communicate Buddhism in a way that feels relevant to the contemporary modern world. Uh, I think what happens in particularly the modern West is that religion is compartmentalised. And, uh, well, actually in the modern West, lots of things are compartmentalised. Science is compartmentalised from philosophy, from the arts. And religion has its own little compartment. And um, if it has its own compartment, if Buddhism is just compartmentalised, as a little part of the human life and human experience, then it's easy to dismiss it. Uh, and a lot of people come to Buddhism, come to meditation, with a great deal of um, faith in science. And if Buddhism were to be somehow seen as anti-science or contrary to scientific findings, like, the, you know, the Catholic Church struggled with Galileo, uh, who was threatening um, church doctrine with his theory that, you know, the earth moved around the sun. If, if Buddhism were to start sort of arguing that its teachings are contrary to science, I think we just end up feeling, I don't know, split somehow. We can't sort of give ourselves wholeheartedly as practitioners. I can't. I studied physics. I think physics is fantastic. I think physics has so much to offer us in terms of, oh, I, I don't just mean in terms of technology like gadgets. I mean in terms of offering um, a perspective on the nature of reality. Uh, so I think, yeah, I do want to see uh, a synthesis, not, not in a cheap, easy way, I think Ian McGilchrist is far from um, a shallow synthesizer. He thinks very, very deeply. And his worldview, which of course includes science, has room for the sacred, for the divine, you could say, for, for the spiritual. He says that that is where meaning lies. So I think that, I, I, I think that this fragmented, compartmentalised worldview that we have in the modern West, modern 
you know, their universities in the West are very compartmentalized. When I went to university, you know, I studied physics, quantum physics, relativity, all those wonderful sort of theories. There was no room to ask what they meant in terms of the philosophical implications for the nature of reality. I think we need, as, as modern day Buddhists, to be thinking in those ways. Yeah? But there are pitfalls. Does that, does that answer your question though? Or attempt, I mean, your question's a big one, so I don't know if I can really do it justice in a few minutes. Thank you very much, that was a great, yeah, great thought-provoking answer. Well, thanks for asking. It, it's, it's a thought-provoking question, an important one. Yeah, good. Um, so next I've got Fabian from Berlin. There you are, Fabian, I can see you on my screen. Can you see me? Can you hear me all right? Yeah, you might need to speak up a bit, but yeah, I can hear you. Is that better? That's better. Okay, well, I have a new computer. I hope this works. <laughs> um, you know, Marcia, I would like to make a, a connection with um, Megil Chris's ideas on the brain and our actual Buddhist practice. Mm. Um, because given that uh, our brain works in these two different modes, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and the mm. left becomes more and more dominant to our detriment, as I understand Megil Chris, yeah. um, Buddhism seems to offer very specific techniques for the left not to take over control. It does. I was wondering what place Buddhist ritual mm. has in that field. You know, I'm talking about puja or mantra chanting, but also meditation in general. They seem to be techniques that rather, um, I don't know, encourage the right hemisphere. So could we talk a bit about these, or could you talk a bit about these, um, about the place of Buddhist ritual? That yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll talk about ritual and then maybe we'll come on to meditation later. So, yeah, Buddhist ritual. Um, uh, well, the first thing that comes to mind is the importance of imagination, the importance of imagination in any human uh, life. Uh, Sangharachita, uh, when he talks about imagination, he doesn't just mean... Um, well, he distinguishes in the way that Coleridge distinguished between uh, imagination and um, fancy. Uh, he doesn't, so by imagination with a capital I, Sangharachita means a way of apprehending reality, a truer way of understanding what it is to be alive and human in this world, uh, a truer way of relating to the world. Uh, as opposed to fantasy, which is a sort of escapist, uh, um, uh, well, it's, 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 it's not, not, not going to point to, to truth. So imagination, um, Buddhist ritual, I think, is concerned with <laughs> awakening and developing and refining imagination with that capital I. Because it's very, very difficult to really understand this wisdom perspective that I was trying to rather clumsily point to before the break, where you had breakout groups. This perspective that I am not a fixed entity. When I refer to me, there is no fixed separate entity there. And that the world that I think of as out there, objective, independent of me, isn't really out there, objective, completely independent of me. And, and it's not a fixed reality either. That's a very counterintuitive uh, idea. Now, ritual, I believe, helps us apprehend that truth through... Um, through visualization, through uh, devotion, through uh, what well, imagination, imagining that we're in the presence of the Buddha, the, an enlightened being who doesn't apprehend the world in that dualistic way of me in here and world out there. In ritual, we can enact and uh, visualize a different way of being. Uh, enlightenment is our own potential. I think we have to imagine that potential into existence. Uh, very difficult to um, uh, approach enlightenment without the imagination. It's not, it's not possible even. 
And, and also, one more thing, ritual starts to treat uh, the world around us as sacred. We start to, if you, if you do ritual and you come out of a ritual and, and I don't know, you go out into uh, the open air and you look at the stars, I don't know, you start to see the world as sacred. Everything becomes imbued with meaning in a way that the reason can't understand. I've just come back from a solitary retreat and at its best, everything around me started to speak of meaning. Uh, it was numinous and I can't say what that meaning was. If I was to put it into words or even attempt to put it into words, it would uh, devalue and um, it wouldn't do it justice. But we know when we're experiencing it and ritual opens that doorway. Uh, it, it allows us to be, become bigger, sorry, than our small-minded rationalism which is actually not true. It's not who we are. Yeah. Does that help, Fabian? Yes, it does. Thanks, Nyavacha. Yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah, good. And now we've got Rachel. I can't see you, Rachel, but I know you're in Nottingham somewhere. Yes, I'm here. I don't know if you can see me now. Uh, I can't still, but anyway, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, there you, are. there you are. I have got you. Right. Okay. Great. So, yeah. So thanks very much for this. Um, my question is about, and maybe this is more the meditation side of practice, but yeah. I, yeah, it really strikes me that a lot of meditation and mindfulness practice is a lot about, to me, it seems about strengthening the right brain yeah. and turning towards and sitting in awareness and not trying to change things. And then I'm really interested in, yeah. so sort of the title of his book, which is master and his emissaries, how does the right brain become the master? In what way can it sort of direct um, action without sort of falling into this kind of yeah. left brainy kind of grasping? Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you have any sort of yeah. thoughts about that? Yeah. Well, I think that you're completely right, of course. Uh, I think all Buddhist practice is pointing to um, uh, um, the right, uh, developing in a way, the right proportions of the right hemisphere's worldview in a way. Um, uh, and meditation certainly does that. Maitreya Bandhu from Monday, at least UK time Monday, is going to be uh, leading five days of meditation, sort of looking at themes from uh, the master and his emissary. So I won't say too much, but what occurs to me <coughs> is that, um, well, one of the things we learn when we start to meditate, particularly when you, do something like the mindfulness of breathing where you're trying to follow the sensations of the breath. You learn how busy the mind is, full of chatter. Chatter that is um, uh, sort of sometimes relevant, but actually usually not. It's usually sort of just um, inane, I don't know, uh, either drivel or sort of anxious chatter about the future or grasping sort of chatter or worrying chatter about the past, but it's not actually very relevant to our experience. Um, it doesn't take us deeper. Meditation is a way of learning to quiet the chattering mind. Uh, the Buddha was said to have a mind that didn't have any chatter. That didn't mean that the Buddha couldn't think. He could think very, very clearly, but he could choose when to think. He could choose when to uh, turn his mind to a particular theme and communicate in a rational way about that theme. Um, Sangharakshita, uh, I believe, was also like that. He's no longer alive, but uh, I've heard that when he was alive, he used to be able to uh, put in his diary a time and a date when he was going to think about something. Uh, that's quite different to how I'm afraid my mind often is, uh, which is full of rather uncontrolled um, thinking, thinking got out of control, um, which doesn't, you know, earlier on today, I was thinking, what shall I say tonight? And for the life of me, when I was trying to, I, I had some time today devoted to planning what I was going to think, say tonight. And my mind couldn't do it. 
And then when I was sort of out walking with a friend, it was full of chatter about tonight. It was just so undisciplined. And that's not exemplary Buddhist kind of ways of being. So I think just meditation, you know, we need that, that capacity to have um, linear thinking, clear linear reason thinking, which I believe the left hemisphere probably um, can do very well. But we mustn't be the servant of that. Um, otherwise, when it gets out of control, particularly in an anxious way, and particularly, you know, in that sort of, um, I don't know, um, horrible internet surfing kind of way where you just go from one site to another or you settle on a YouTube page but you don't listen to the whole thing. You know how we get more and more attention deficit kind of, I'm feeling it in the last few years, uh, that my attention has got worse just because of my internet kind of habit. Um, so that's the left brain, I believe, getting out of control. Um, uh, and I think that meditation and a lot of Buddhist practice, um, being in nature, being on retreat, helps us um, uh, in a way not let ourselves be dominated by incessant left hemispherical kind of thinking. Yeah. Good. Uh, but yeah, Maitri Bandhu, I, I'm, I'm sure we'll expand on that during uh, the week, next week. But thanks, Rachel. Thanks for your question. There's more I could say, but I'm also aware that I want to open up just for uh, the remaining time that we've got to other people's questions. But thank you, yes. So, Nick, I'm going to ask if there are any... I can see lots of questions in the chat, but I'm not going to read them out. Uh, Nick is going to just pick one or two and then we can see how we do. So here's one. Over the course of this project, there is an opportunity to evolve consciousness. How does consciousness evolve and how would I know that my consciousness has evolved? Okay. So how does consciousness evolve and how, do I, how would I know that my consciousness has evolved? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how consciousness evolves. I, I, I just know it does. I just know it does. I know that we're creatures of um, habit. And um, if you meditate regularly, you will feel different. You will feel, I mean, despite what I've just said about me not being able to control my thinking, uh, you will, if you meditate, tend to uh, become... Uh, uh, calmer, have more perspective, not be so driven by um, uh, random uh, thoughts, uh, be more, become more aware of uh, our emotional world, what's really going on, be more uh, aware of our motivations, have more uh, capacity to not react from the immediate uh, impulse that arises when there's a stimulus, but to stand back and decide what is a, a creative response to the situation, the person, somebody shouts at you, do you just shout back? Or can you, can you be a bit more measured in your response and creative in your response? Meditation will do all of those things. That is an evolution in consciousness. Uh, you'll know when that happens. If you do uh, engage with this project, particularly if you engage with the practices that are going to be offered, uh, the meditation practices that are going to be offered, and continue doing them, I can guarantee you will notice a difference. Um, I used to think when I first came along that you had to meditate for years before you noticed a difference actually a week or uh, uh, even uh, a few days of meditation, if you do it uh, um, uh, wholeheartedly, you'll start to notice a, a difference. So consciousness does evolve because we're not fixed. There is nothing static about us. We're, 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 we're more akin to uh, uh, processes. Um, um, we're more akin to a, a fluid kind of stream of course, what does happen is that we congeal 
um, and we get sort of more and more um, uh, habituated. So if I keep flicking channels on the telly or surfing the internet in a mindless kind of graspy way, uh, I will feel my consciousness start to become narrow uh, and more tight and more sort of, I'll, be, I'll, I'll start to feel more um, unsatisfied and um, uh, sort of depleted. You know that horrible feeling where you feel both tired and yet wired? Uh, I think that's something that modern technology can do. That's a, a narrowing of consciousness. If you start to practice Buddhist practices, you find that consciousness expands because it's not a fixed thing. It, it really isn't. But we can become habituated. And Buddhist practice is about undoing unhelpful habits and learning to uh, feel more expansive, brighter, It'll feel more flexible, it'll feel more free, it'll feel more connected uh, with other people and with nature and the world around you. Um, it'll feel um, quieter, but also more joyful. It'll feel more content. It might even feel blissful. Uh, all of those qualities will arise and more uh, uh, that show that consciousness is evolving. So I don't know who asked that question, but um, I, I sort of just say, yeah, try it. Do try it. I'm glad you're here tonight. Try it. Try this, all the practices that are going to be sort of uh, offered on this project. Um, uh, if you're near a Buddhist centre, you know, engage there uh, and see there is an evolution of consciousness possible. And it's limitless. That's what Buddhism would say. It's limitless. There isn't a ceiling on consciousness. It's potentially, well... To use a spatial metaphor, consciousness is potentially infinite. Uh, um, it's not, it's definitely not confined to uh, the head and the area that the brain occupies or even the area that the body occupies. It will feel expansive and potentially boundless. And uh, uh, if it really, if you touch on that sort of boundlessness, it will also feel... Um, uh, of the nature of love. I, yeah. I asked the question, Yanavach, to Kashadaka here. Oh, hello. And, um, You've broken hi, the yeah. rules of Kashadaka. You've jumped in. <laughs> but, but... Apologies. No, apologies. go on then. I just wanted to um, uh, uh, share Bente's um, talk on the higher evolution <coughs> might be a clue into what, you're, what, what you've been talking about. And yeah. that reflect, yeah. and that reflection is the doorway into conscious evolution. Reflection is um, so, a doorway, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. into conscious evolution. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And we have to learn how to reflect, don't we? Which is different to um, a sort of neurotic uh, thinking. Yeah. It's a, you know, Sankarachita was able to genuinely reflect and that in itself is, a, is, a, is an art. But yeah, no, thank you, Akashtaka. Okay, next I'm gonna ask the questions. And he's going to ask another one. We've got so, for at least one more. So leading on from that, yeah. um, a question from Paul. Yeah, hello, Paul. In my experience, only direct experience of the vastness and mystery of consciousness yeah. um, really shifts people's views on this and builds shraddha. Would you agree? So I don't know if you heard that. Can you all hear that, Nick speaking? Shall I repeat the question? Yeah, I'll repeat the question. So in Paul's experience, only a direct experience of the vastness and the mystery of consciousness, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, um, in a way really shifts people's views uh, and builds faith, builds confidence, builds shraddha. Would I agree? Yeah, I would agree. I think that you have to really experience it for yourself in order to really feel convinced at the same time, I think that uh, studying, reflecting is really important. So our views will govern uh, our experience. That's really important. Our views aren't just some sort of passive thing. Um, they, they shape our world. Uh, they shape our world 
uh, view, our, uh, not our worldview, they shape our actual experience of the world. So let me just give you a wee example. So if I have a deep-seated view that I'm unlovable, I'm unlikable, that nobody likes me, um, I'm likely to go around interacting in a way that is defended, defensive, uh, on the lookout for any slight or any, do you know what I mean, any rejection. And um, if I'm looking for that, I'm going to find that, particularly if I approach other people in an already defended manner. It wouldn't be surprising if they respond then in kind. And then that would just reinforce my view, my self-view. And hey, presto, I've just once more reinforced uh, my experience of the world and confirmed my view. Now, that's just a, a, a sort of tiny example um, from a sort of psychological perspective. But actually, you could even extend that, if I had time, to views about the nature of reality. Um, so, for example, if I do believe that the body is all there is and that when the body dies, the lights go out. That view is um, narrowing and limiting and leads to an unhappy life where I feel more isolated from others and from the world around me. And, and if I let that spiral downwards, it could lead to serious mental illness. Um, shraddha, which is the Buddhist word for faith, isn't just faith in anything, it's faith in the Buddha and his teaching and in enlightened beings. So Shraddha isn't just faith um, in uh, whatever I want to believe, it's faith in a transcendental reality. And that will always lead to an expansive experience of the world, uh, uh, an experience that feels more connected with others, because we really are not separate. We identify ourselves as our bodies and then say, oh yeah, our bodies are separate, and so we must be separate. But actually, mind isn't limited to body. Mind goes beyond that. We will start to experience ourselves as more connected. Unconditional love will be a more natural uh, uh, aspect of our experience of the world rather than hatred and um, uh, resentment and um, uh, uh, feeling a, a victim of the world, of our lives. We will start to feel more agency in a creative way. So that's what Shraddha leads to. That's quite different from confirmation bias where our our, our bias is tending towards something that's just going to entrench us in a painful life. Yeah. So maybe that's um, uh, worth ending on. I just want to maybe just say one more thing, which is this work of working on our minds is, I think, the most important thing that we can be doing with our lives. It is the most important thing. Everything else, of course, we have to, most of us earn a living and, you know, uh, look after our, our, our family and friends and do all the utilitarian things like drive and buy things and get our breakfast. But none of that is of paramount importance. None of that really matters when we come to die. None of that is, is as important as it, working on evolving our minds. Uh, uh, that is surely what we're here to do. And the fact that you've got a modern day writer of the intelligence and sensitivity of Ian McGilchrist, who also happens to be a psychiatrist, also a neuroscientist, saying much the same thing, is uh, a boon, and uh, we should engage in that, I think. So I'm going to hand back to Sardinandi now. Over to you, Sardinandi. Thank you, Nyan Vacha. Thank you. Oh, Thank sorry. you. It's a great pleasure. Just I'm just sitting here quietly, sort of witnessing this great conversation going on between us all, and um, I was thinking how rare it is to have a, somebody who's studied physics talking about unconditional love mm. and faith so sort of fully. Uh, so I think both sides of the brain was probably working pretty well a lot of the time there. So thank you very much. Yeah. And what uh, I just want to just entreat that lovely treatment at the end of um, how the importance of working on one's mind or knowing one's mind. 
and how much of us are prey to whatever's going on in our mind. And um, I think we just don't understand what a resource we have and also how we just don't understand what it is. We, don't, we just don't have a perspective on our own mind. I can think of some people I know who've had serious sort of mental health issues because they're just not understanding what's quite going on. And we really could have the tools to understand a little bit more um, what's really happening to us. So I hope yeah, all of us stay on board to explore all that. So I'm going to just bring in Maitri Bandhu, who's going to be leading the meditations in a couple of days' time, and he'll just introduce that. And thank you again to uh, Nyala Bacha. Hello there, my name is Maitre Bandhu. Uh, really lovely to be here this evening. Really lovely, really lovely to see you all. Um, yeah, so from Monday, at least in the UK, at 7 a.m. on Monday, uh, uh, UK time, and if you look at the website, it'll tell you all the other times. I'll be leading five um, meditation um, classes, basically. We'll, I'll be teaching about meditation, we'll be doing meditation, and there's a ch chance for questions and answers. So what I'm trying to do is say, okay, we've hopefully by now we've watched the, the two interviews with Ian McGilchrist, myself and John of Archer. Then we've been to this seminar perhaps and really thought about it a bit more. And then, but that's not enough, is it? It's not enough just to think about it a bit more. We need to embody it. We need to actually change our mind, yeah? So for the, those five days from Monday, uh, I'll be guiding us into some of uh, Ian McGilchrist's key ideas about wholeness in particular and embodiedness. So we're calling this, this sequence of meditation masterclasses, we're calling it embodied mind, yeah? So join me uh, from Monday morning at 7 a.m. UK time. Um, have a look at the, we'll be sending you a reminder about it I think on Sunday, so um, tune into that, and uh, I look forward to seeing you. Back to you. Thank you, Thank you. Bandhu. Very good. Yeah, so that's drawing the evening to a close, or drawing this session to a